I will always associate the summer of 2010 with Alpha Protocol. Although playing a game is not nearly as profound as graduating high school or going away to college, it's what I always think of when remembering that time in my life. The game is so ambitious, even to a fault, as it tries to blend several different gameplay elements into one cohesive product, despite leaving multiple elements unpolished or even broken. But the parts of the game that are well executed stand out as the defining features of what I consider to be still, to this day, one of the best role-playing games ever made. Nine years after its release, no other game has ever given players the experience of playing as an international spy the way Obsidian did with Alpha Protocol. It's flawed, it's ambitious, but most of all, it's ahead of its time. Here's why Alpha Protocol is, to me, one of my favorite games of all time. Alpha Protocol was marketed as the espionage RPG. Say all you want about its dreadful combat, convoluted story, dated graphics, or wealth of technical problems which still exist today, but there's no denying Alpha Protocol lives up to its billing. You can truly roleplay as a secret agent in many ways depending on your personality. The central theme of the game is reactivity, as in the game is built on reacting to the many choices you make throughout it. The game will even account for choices you make that you didn't even realize you made. In addition to the reaction of the choices you make, the game is also built around the way in which you play it. As in, whether you decide to emphasize stealth over combat, whether you decide to play lethal or non-lethal, and whether you decide to spend money on intel. In addition, the game has a deep and involved customization system for weapons, armor, gadgets, and abilities. It's for all these reasons I consider Alpha Protocol to be one of the best RPGs of all time. The game puts you into the shoes of Michael Thornton, an agent for the American government in a program known as Alpha Protocol, a highly mysterious initiative conducting ops undercover of total secrecy, even to most of its members. The game starts with Thornton's initiation which serves as a tutorial to the player. One can learn the mechanics of espionage, weapons, and gadgets, or you can choose to bypass any and all you don't want to do. Tutorials are often patronizing in games and come off as hand-holding, but in this context, it works perfectly well because like you, Thornton is also learning the ins and outs of what it takes to do his job. The most interesting aspect of training is that part of the espionage course involves Thornton sneaking through Greybox to retrieve a package. This actually simulates going on a mission in the regular game, and serves as a great introduction to one of the better aspects of the game's combat system, stealth, which I'll touch on much more later in detail. It also gives you a glimpse into your first assignment in Saudi Arabia, which makes the realization of this mission feel completely organic, just like an agent would learn of his or her assignment in the real world. After you're done training, you meet with Westridge, the chief of operations, and you learn more about the game's mechanics. You learn about the reputation and dialogue systems. You learn that your endurance and special abilities will cool down in real time during conversations. You learn that taking an enemy by surprise can be an effective tool in combat. And you learn about the impact of dossiers. All of this is cleverly disguised as part of the indoctrination process that comes across as a naturally occurring part of the game. When you finish at Greybox, you're dispatched to Saudi Arabia to track down stolen missiles from the Hellback Corporation, a private defense contractor for the U.S. The game's events were set into motion as some of the missiles were used to shoot down a commercial airliner. After tracking down various leads, Thornton intercepts Sheikh Ali Shaheed, the leader of the terrorist group al Samad. After dealing with Shaheed, missiles hone in on Thornton's location and he is presumed either to have gone rogue or dead as Alpha Protocol has been infiltrated by Halbeck operatives. You discover Halbeck is seeking to raise global tensions to start a new Cold War, with them being the beneficiary of this as they will have the entire world as their own personal black market. With the help of your handler, Mina Tang, Thornton seeks to uncover the conspiracy between Halbeck, Al-Samad, and Alpha Protocol, 
and it's at this point the game properly begins. At the heart of Alpha Protocol's core gameplay is the unique dialogue system. Each response you give can be either aggressive. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Whoa, calm down. I was just. Suave. I think I've got you beat. You ever been a pushy woman in the heart of Arabia? Once. Lost a bet. Cute. Or professional. I'm in claims and acquisitions for Halbeck, apparently. Still getting a feel for the job. Basically, you're given the choice to act like Jack Bauer, James Bond, or Jason Bourne. But it doesn't end at how you choose to respond. Instead, how you respond to others will have an effect on how they respond to you. Certain personality responses will rub people the wrong way. Other responses will earn their respect. This system is known as reputation. What makes this such a cool design element is that the way in which you learn how a specific person will respond gives so much freedom to the player. For example, the most common method is simply observing them and their personality. You have to be aware of their social cues and make a quick decision as to what response will suit them best. Sometimes it takes some trial and error, but often you can tell just by observing them and listening to them speak. Here's an example. Just look at this guy for a second and try to get a feel for which of the three responses he will like best. Now listen to him speak. I have no interest in bantering with an American cowboy. It upsets my digestion. Please, get to the point. Based solely on how he looks and how he talks, do you think he's more likely to be aggressive, suave, or professional? You just heard him say he doesn't like to banter and that he wants you to get to the point. So being suave will annoy him and being aggressive will turn him away. Based on this, you go with professional. Someone is planning to assassinate Ronald's son. You've been receiving transfers of funds from Shahid. I'd be willing to pay to see if these two facts are connected. Hmm, interesting. I admire a man who presents a business proposal clearly and succinctly. And sure enough, he confirms that he prefers to handle things professionally and we gain positive reputation with him. Let's see what happens if we're aggressive instead. You must be Hong Shur, boss of the White Oak Mountain Triad. Oh, sorry, legitimate businessman. You're connected to Ali Shahid. Interpol has been leveling that same accusation for 15 years. <laughs> if they haven't been able to prove it, why should I believe you can, Mr. Uh... Thornton. Mike Thornton. You might have heard of me. I've been around the block a few times. Rome, Moscow. <laughs> so have my prostitutes. But I never bothered to learn their names. Now it may not be rocket science, but it's still interactive enough to give the player a more hands-on approach to speaking with an NPC, something not seen in even the better RPGs out there. The way reactivity factors into the dialogue system is that the reputations you have with certain people will directly impact how easier or harder the game is for you to play. For example, take Grigori. He's a source on your mission to Moscow and will likely be the first person you meet after Saudi Arabia. If you treat him with respect and friendliness while showing an interest in him as a person, he will be helpful to you and assist you throughout the hub. If you greet him with hostility and head slams, he will alert the authorities about your presence and will show no assistance unless you divert the shipment to him at the train yard. This is best illustrated at the U.S. Embassy. Treating him right will yield regular guards much easier to get past either through conversation or shooting. Treating him wrong will yield U.S. Marines, heavily armed and armored, and not nearly as easy to bluff past. If you've alienated Stephen Heck, he will sell you out to authorities for being Sung's assassin. This guy says to me, Oh God, please don't kill me! I just came here to offer you five million dollars to give Michael Thornton up as Ronald Sung's assassin! That's what it's gonna be, huh? Somehow I'm not surprised. These guys really seem to hate you, buddy. And well, I'm not too fond of you either. So I figured what the hey. Enjoy your 15 minutes of fame. Searching for American citizen Michael Thornton in connection with the attack. Go but if you befriended him, he will stick up for you. Tell me you didn't. Not gonna lie, buddy. I was really tempted for a minute there. But I kinda like you, so I told him to piss off. Then I set him on fire to make sure he got the point. <laughs> Shouldn't you have stabbed him to make sure he got the point? I figured his cronies would probably try and find somebody less scrupulous than myself. So I went ahead and called the news stations. Should keep them off your back for a while. 
I appreciate that. Hey, no problem, buddy. I'm gonna lay low for a while, but I'll be in touch. Be seeing you, Mike. Searching for a man called Wen Shu in connection with the attack. Even in some of the more classic RPGs, conversations can be seen as downtime. There's not a whole lot of anxiety to making a particular choice. Furthermore, you can overload on skill points that make your character better at talking their way through a situation, in essence making it automatic. This is the case in the 7th generation Fallout games, even New Vegas, coincidentally also developed by Obsidian and released roughly 5 months later. By maxing out your speech to 100, you can talk your way past the most dangerous of enemies with practically no problem. Similarly, the original Mass Effect games let you max out your charm or renegade to instantly get past. Alpha Protocol does not give you the chance to level up your speech skill because there is no speech skill. Every dialogue choice is essentially starting from zero. Instead, your ability to smooth talk your way through depends on how attentive and well read you are on a particular character and or situation. You have to carefully assess the situation and make the best choice. This is where Alpha Protocol excels in a way other games simply don't. You're not just pressing buttons and taking guesses. You're making educated choices based on common sense and research. Much more interactive and enjoyable. Now when I just mentioned being well read and doing your research, I'm talking about Intel. Once again the espionage theme is brought to the forefront. You can uncover intel through regular conversations, sometimes having to pry information out of people through picking the right choices, which further emphasizes the importance of paying close attention and making the right decision. But you can also acquire intel through purchase at the clearinghouse. Before every mission, you will have the opportunity to buy intel that will help you on that mission. This intel can actually be really cool, and it reinforces the importance of your reputation with others as certain pieces of intel can only be bought if you have a positive reputation with a particular character. For example, if you spared Shahid's life in Saudi Arabia, you can buy ally support when investigating the ruins transmission in Rome, allowing you to bypass the Al Samad members without a fight. If you are on good terms with Albatross and either deleted the bugs during the previous mission or bluffed him into thinking you did, G22 will provide added support when intercepting the assassination plans. Agent Thornton, there's a series of pipes running below the catwalks. You may be able to use them to avoid the patrols. Also, being allied with Albatross will allow you to buy a sniper rifle dead drop to use to defend Surkov, making the mission way easier if you're playing on hard. You can also gain ridiculous benefits from the choices you make throughout the game. If you choose to extort Nasri rather than kill him or arrest him, the cost of buying additional supplies will drop from $2,500 to $4. But probably the coolest example is at the end of Moscow. Breko is one of the tougher boss fights, and after dealing damage up to a certain point, he will begin snorting coke and go into a rage in which he chases you around and stabs you with his knives. Now if you've already met Stephen Heck and have a good rapport with him, before you assault Breko's mansion, he will actually deliver tainted cocaine to Breko's house which will slowly drain his health and slow him down, making him much easier to fight. A great element of intel is dossiers. Dossiers can be bought at the clearinghouse, extracted from conversations, or found through exploration. Dossiers will give you an idea of what a particular individual or faction is all about and this information will tip you off on strengths, weaknesses, personality traits, and other useful information making the game much better of an experience. Unlocking certain characters' dossiers in full will grant you a perk that makes you more effective in combat with that person. You can also unlock secret facts about people which gives you an insight into their background you otherwise would never know. It's in this way you are further given the feel that you are employing the tactics of espionage to accomplish your mission. Aside from having to buy intel from people you have a good reputation with, you can earn perks just from the relationship you have with that person without having to spend money at all. Perks are automatically awarded based on that relationship, whether it's good or bad. This goes hand in hand with your handlers. Take Mina for example. Since you spend a large part of the game with her assisting you, it's easier to see how your relationship with her will affect the way the game is played. Being neutral to liked with her will grant the constant encouragement perk, giving you plus 10 to endurance. Being trusted to friendship gives you plus 15 endurance. But even being hated by her grants a 10% reduction in the time it takes to cool down special abilities. 
every handler in the game follows a similar algorithm, so no matter how you treat people, there will be a particular effect on the way you play. This gives you yet another thing to consider when playing. Should I be nice to this person, or should I be a jerk? Other perks are obtained by the seemingly inconsequential choices you make throughout the game. At Greybox, you can get a perk just by watching the news. Yeah, that's right, watching Shahid's broadcast will grant the News Conscious perk, giving you a 5% discount on Intel from all Saudi vendors. Not only that, since perks can be obtained by your actions in the game, and since many depend on mutually exclusive choices, your player will be customized based on the way you play. For example, if you choose to execute Sis after her fight, you will get the Sororicide perk reducing the cooldown for Chain Shot. If you let her go, you get the I Don't Hit Girls perk giving you a 5% discount from all transactions with G22. You also have the option to romance the female characters of the game, and unsurprisingly, each successful romance leads to a perk. Z's is the most rewarding as you are granted reduced cooldowns for Fury, Room Sweep, Iron Will, and Hard to Kill. It's also the most rewarding because... Well, you know. But the game's reputation system does not simply stop at displaying an increase or decrease after a choice and granting a perk on the spot. What separates Alpha Protocol from other RPGs is that the entirety of your choices throughout the game will have an effect on specific characters. This is best illustrated with Marburg, perhaps the most complex and intricately designed character in the entire game. Marburg is Leland's chief of security. He's basically Halbeck's loyal terrier. But despite his cold and unfeeling outlook on people, referring to them not as people but as assets, he lives by a code that may not easily be corrupted. You first meet him in Rome after the Albara mission, and it's here you are treated to one of the best scenes I've ever played in a game. Aside from getting the chance to either increase or decrease your reputation with him, you will notice your reputation increasing or decreasing on its own as a result of your previous actions up to that point. Actions that you might not have ever expected to matter at all. If you told Westridge you wanted to serve your country at the beginning of the game, Tell me why you're here. Not everyone gets chosen for this line of work, but you volunteered. Usually we have to ask. I want to serve my country. You will earn Marburg's respect as he shares the same commitment to his country and the mission. If you already went to Moscow and made friends with Z... I did not realize you knew how to kill so well. I don't like to brag. <laughs> and so polite. Maybe I should keep a more careful eye on you. Marburg will take offense to this because of Marburg's reciprocal hatred for her. And you were the one who crossed paths with a German mercenary in Moscow. Z. I get around, and she was a little insistent we get together. I am not surprised. She is a mercenary, but hardly professional, or discreet, it seems. He will also respect you if you've managed to stay under the radar in Rome up to that point. You, on the other hand, have managed to enter Rome quietly. I didn't know you were here until an hour ago. You're skilled at keeping a low profile. Conversely, if you've drawn attention to yourself, he will rebuke you. He will also comment on whether you've killed Americans during your initial missions in Rome. Considering how public your actions have been in Rome, and how many CIA and NSA agents you've killed, I think you're hardly in a place to lecture me. There's even a check of the total number of aggressive, suave, and professional choices you've made up to this point. If your total suave exceeds aggressive and professional, you will lose reputation, while if your total professional exceeds aggressive and suave, you will gain reputation. This is because he only handles things professionally and absolutely despises someone who thinks they're a charming smooth talker. Here, the game accounts for and reacts to the way you've played the game up to that point. But the complexity of Marburg's character does not end there. Normally, Marburg will escape during the fight and you will meet him at the end of the game. But, if you choose to disarm the bombs at the museum, after you wound him enough, you will have the ability to talk him into finishing the fight rather than running away provided he despises you and you've unlocked all of his dossier. The scene plays out like a well-crafted work of art. All of your decisions up to that point 
including Marburg's opinion of you, will force him to act totally against character and give in to his impulses rather than being the calm, methodical, and calculated person he normally is. If you're trying to kill me, you're not doing a very good job. You'll make a mistake. No, you're the one who's messed up. Maybe Leyland should put your octogenarian ass out to pasture with the other cattle. He will anyway, eventually. If only to bury his dirty little secrets. You understand nothing, Thornton. Just the way the U.S. trains all their agents. Does Leyland send you out for dry cleaning too? Maybe shoot your chauffeur on the way? Chief of security for Halbeck, talk about a joke. Even if you survive this, you're screwed. You'll go back to your amazing life setting bombs for Halbeck and shooting innocent hostages in the back. How fucked up and empty do you have to be to lower yourself to that level? You know what, Marburg? At the end of the day, at least I'm not somebody's lapdog. Enjoy living on Leyland's scraps. You don't even know what trust and loyalty are. Another outstanding example of this is when you meet Parker at the end of the game. Similar to Marburg, Parker is calculating, methodical, and as by the numbers as you get. He wastes no time on small talk. Was there anything else? Intelligence analyst, huh? Find any yet? Excuse me? Intelligence, I mean. Ah, humor. Fine, that joke killed the graduation. His role as an intelligence analyst gives him the unique position of knowing basically all of the information before making a decision. The problem is, his analysis is flawed, and depending on your choices, you can point this out to him, thereby turning him to your side. Parker's analysis suggests that Thornton would have killed Shahid, Braco, and Omendang. But, if you choose to spare all three, Thornton will chide Parker and expose him for failing to see the error of his ways. And I did what I do best. Analyze. Provided you had all the information. I did have all the information. No. No, you didn't. Parker Shahid isn't dead. I didn't kill him in Saudi Arabia. That missile never hit him. He'll be broadcasting in an hour. What you said about Moscow, that distribution center is shut down, and I found the real source there. Surkov's now working for me, and he has all the evidence I need to bring this place down. Taipei, the op you had there, where I ran into Omen, he's still alive, and he didn't appreciate being used any more than I did. He'll be pitching in too, along with the rest of China. I know you well enough, Agent. I assume you have proof of this. You're a logical guy, Parker. With what I told you, how do you think this is going to play out? Your mistake's not going to look good on a field report, or the nightly news. But it doesn't have to be your mistake. I take it you have a plan? Yeah. You've been drafted. So you better start making yourself useful right now. The game's reactivity is also illustrated in your conversations with Leland. He will directly reference the choices you made throughout the game. For example, the way you handled your initial missions in Rome. You weren't hard to find in Rome, you know. After that debacle at the CIA listening post. The reports of what happened in that gelato shop. The shooting outside of Rome. That poor professor. Taking the bullet like that. At the end of the game, you will not be able to reconcile with Alpha Protocol if you've killed Americans at any point, and Leland will make this clear. You killed CIA agents in the line of duty. You added some NSA agents to your body count in Rome. No American agent gets away with that in the end. You're not pretending to be a rogue agent anymore. You are one. They'll execute you. Me? I have a different perspective on the situation. The game also reacts to simple choices from the clothing you wear. That outfit of yours has enough pockets to hold a toolbox. Are you here to check the internet cable? Only if you let me plant a bug on it. To the handler you select for certain missions. If Albatross is your handler for Braco's mansion, he will drop you on the roof with a sniper rifle. If it's Z, you will get a striker.
At the end of the game, if you've been cold to Scarlet, you will not have the chance to turn her to your side and she will get the drop on you revealing her partnership with Leland and her identity as Sung's assassin. Now, as much praise as I'm heaping on this game, one thing that cannot be denied is that the game's shooting system is an utter and complete failure for many reasons. The first is that the enemy AI is horrible, so much so you will probably find yourself laughing out loud at the sheer stupidity. You might be able to use this to your advantage, but the flip side is that enemies will frustratingly charge your position for a melee attack, then pump you full of lead as you find yourself in a daze. It's not a problem on easy, and likely not a problem on normal, but on hard, this tactic can actually kill you pretty quickly. Alpha Protocol is without question one of the worst third person shooters of its time. The aiming mechanic is so stiff that you're almost better off not using the sights at all. But shooting from the hip is terribly inaccurate unless you're using the shotgun or SMGs at close range. The assault rifle is needed on higher difficulties against certain bosses, but the process of waiting for your critical meter to hone in on your target can take too long, resulting in sudden death. Conversely, shooting the pistol at intermediate range and beyond without using the critical meter makes the pistol almost useless. Throwing grenades and incendiaries fares slightly more effective because at least you're given a throwing arc which tells you where it'll land, but sometimes the depth of field makes this frustrating. One cool element is that you can ricochet explosives off walls for bank shots. This will help alleviate the problem of your target running out of dodge and avoiding damage. The special abilities you can use in tandem with guns do little to better the experience with the exception of chain shot for the pistol. This ability lets you freeze time to line up your shots and even fill out your critical meter to basically one shot kill as many enemies as your particular ability will allow. But other than that, the abilities are still working within the limits of the shooting system so they don't make much of a difference. For example, Bullet Storm eliminates the need to reload while active, but it doesn't fix the terrible aiming mechanic. Similarly, focused aim locks on with the assault rifle, but unless you're at closer range, it doesn't matter because you won't hit farther targets anyway. Furthermore, it locks on to the target's center of mass, which is likely armored, which means it takes more bullets to deal damage, whereas one or two headshots would suffice. And room sweep makes every shot a critical hit, but the shotgun is still plagued by the problems already mentioned. If you choose to run and gun your way through the game, you'll probably be frustrated. But, if you choose to utilize stealth, you'll probably enjoy the game much more. This is probably the only aspect of the combat the game gets right. Sneaking your way through levels feels entirely rewarding and worthwhile, and really fun too. If you can look past the dreadful AI which is for the most part oblivious to you even in what should be their line of sight, nothing adds to the espionage feel more than silently taking out enemies from both close range and at distance. The perks for stealth are much more practical and beneficial, like the Shadow Operative perk which makes you invisible, allowing you to take out an entire room without a single shot fired. Awareness will point out enemies and their points of view along with their alert statuses, so you know if they're aware of you or not. And at higher levels, the awareness perk even activates on its own. Silent running is just what it sounds like. Since normally running creates a ton of noise, this ability allows you to run past enemies without them being the wiser, so long as they don't see you, of course. Remote hacking can be helpful if you don't want to expose yourself by walking right up to a console. And all of these abilities can be used in tandem with brilliance, which instantly recharges all of your abilities. As you've probably noticed, abilities work on timers. And once the ability is used up, it takes a designated amount of time for it to recharge so you can use it again. What makes this mechanic so interactive is that the countdowns for these abilities run in real time. So, if you walk into a fight with an ability still cooling down, it might benefit you to draw out the conversation and stall, buying yourself some time. This is something I bet not many people who reviewed the game at release even noticed. But it's these small intricacies that make the game so memorable. Going back to stealth, you can play quietly without having to engage in close quarters if you customize your weapons with silencers. You can also load tranquilizer rounds to avoid shedding blood. It's in this way you see the deep customization available to the player. Not only weapons, but armor as well. There are a wealth of mods for every type of weapon and ammo, and you can customize anything and everything to fit your playstyle. For example, if you want to go under the radar, putting a suppressor on your gun is a must, but you also need to pick armor that will dampen the sound. You can choose the tactical stealth outfit or choose a different one and mod it to make your movements quiet. 
If you want to run a gun, you probably will want to choose the assault rifle and either the shotgun or SMGs and add extended clips and superior barrels to maximize damage. You can also minimize the recoil and increase the stability. Your armor should probably have high damage resistance and endurance. If you choose to use a lot of gadgets, you will need an outfit with many inventory slots. You can even add digital camouflage to reduce the range at which an enemy will spot you. All of these choices add to the espionage aspect of this game and further emphasize the role playing elements. You can truly choose to play the game any way you want, and the game will adapt to the way you play rather than forcing you to play one particular way over another. There are even more great design elements still, like the level design. The levels are great for exploration because of the importance of dossiers. Finding dossiers in the field will make the experience better. You can also find loose cash to use for buying intel or weapons, armor, modifications, or gadgets. You can also find those modifications through exploration as well, and there are some really unique mods that you can't buy through the clearinghouse. The hacking and lockpicking minigames are not the most innovative, but it's cool that they're in real time, so you will have to balance hacking and lockpicking with combat unless you want to be a sitting duck. Leveling up your sabotage skill set will make you more effective in tackling these mini games, which will award cash, mods, intel, and also make the game better to play by shutting off cameras, opening doors, etc. Choosing which skills to level up add to the role playing because you can choose whether you're going to go tactical stealth or run and gun. Your skills will directly influence your effectiveness at either. In all of these aspects, the central theme of reactivity comes full circle because the game reacts to the type of style you choose to play. You may go through the entire game without purchasing one cent of intel, and spend all your money instead on weapons and armor. Conversely, you may never even fire a gun, except for boss fights where it's necessary, and choose to spend your money on gadgets and intel that allow you to sneak your way through. Few games offer this much freedom in the way you choose to play. On top of the actual gameplay, the game is rife with interesting characters and colorful set pieces. The Braco fight is one of the more memorable moments, squaring off with this coke addicted rich playboy in an 80s decorated room with autographs turn up the radio blaring in the background. Hope we got the special blend hex set. I've already mentioned Marburg, but I'll say again I think he's one of the more interesting characters in a game I've played. With this off-center quality of being totally unflinching and exacting but also committed to his country and the cause. Stephen Heck is also one of the more memorable characters as an eccentric and enigmatic operative who loves terror and destruction. It's also one of the best performances from Nolan North that many people probably don't even know he did. Hey buddy, do you like those TV and then there's the mysterious Omen Dang, feared by many, understood by none, but if you take the time to talk to him, you discover he's actually a double agent. Then your sources are mistaken. Romancing Mina is also really cool because you spend the entire game with her helping you out from a different country, but for the first time since Greybox, you stand face to face with her and get the chance to express your feelings for one another. Is it odd, seeing me in person? Similarly, the Madison character arc is memorable because it's one of the few instances of Thornton becoming emotionally attached, which makes the sequence at the museum all the more impactful. You brought it on her. You pulled the trigger. These characters and performances just add to the experience, making the game much more than just about the gameplay. You really appreciate all the game has to offer in its entirety as one cohesive product. It's a shame Alpha Protocol got lambasted in reviews and failed to have any sort of commercial impact. I think the game was too ambitious for its liking, and so it comes off as rough around the edges. It definitely could have used a few more months of polishing and retooling, and probably also deserved a better marketing strategy as the ads for the game didn't adequately reflect its strengths and made it more about the action, which ironically is its biggest weakness. 
I'm glad to see the game has developed a sort of cult following with some circles even requesting a sequel. At the very least, I'd be interested to see the game get a next gen remake so Obsidian could get another crack at it based on what they learned the first time around. But since Sega owns the rights and hasn't even so much as commented on the game since its release, that's probably just wishful thinking. At any rate, I'm glad I took a chance on this game 9 years ago, and I will always remember the first time I played it and how much I enjoyed it. Hopefully this video will serve as an introduction to the game for someone who either never heard of it or never cared to check it out, because I believe it has so much more to offer. Maybe one day Alpha Protocol will finally get the respect and admiration it deserves. But until then, its fans can always return to this flawed and ambitious game that was ahead of its time.